Good morning, afternoon, and evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the Ecosystem and Biodiversity Cafe webinar. And within the UNDP, uh, we organize regular cafe sessions, we call it cafe so that it's more informal, for the mutual learning of a biodiversity team scattered around the world. But this particular webinar is a special one because it's co-organized with FAO, International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food System, Agroecology Fund, and Eco Agriculture Partners, targeting also a bit wider audience. I am Midori Paxton, and I'm the UNDP Head of Ecosystem and Biodiversity, based at our headquarters in New York. So many of you have heard the alarming news last week from the new IGBES Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. One million species are at risk of extinction. Only a quarter of the land on Earth is free from human impact, and by 2050, the figure could drop to one-tenth of the land surface. Agriculture and related deforestation and habitat loss, the largest contribution to biodiversity loss, as well as climate crisis. And we are in the midst of ecological breakdown. And as the development agency of the United Nations, we at UNDP fully recognize that health of the natural world is a fundamental basis for tackling development challenges, including climate crisis, inequalities, and insecurity. Tackling food and agriculture issues, therefore, and working towards establishment of sustainable global food system is a priority area for us to working, which requires the effort uh, and the cooperation of many sectors and disciplines. So therefore, within our large biodiversity portfolio, supporting over 140 countries, we count at least 154 projects in 81 countries, which directly support food and agriculture related work. So these include support for sustainable and resilient farming practices, capacity development for increasing crop productivity or marketing, and land use planning and landscape management, and reforming agricultural commodity supply chains or subsidies for agriculture. And we have also been part of the FAO-led agroecology initiative since its inception last year in April. And we see uh, one of our roles as UNDP in this initiative to be actively promoting application of agroecology principles and approaches in the project sites and in our landscapes and demonstrating upscaling and development impact. So therefore, I am excited to co-organize this seminar today uh, with the partners to enhance our understanding on the agroecological approach and how it can unleash the potential of sustainable farming, yielding multiple development benefits and to support countries in achieving SDGs. This is our plan uh, for the next 20, 90 minutes. We will start with a keynote presentation by Dr. Emil Furison, and we will have a short Q&A session after that, followed by a presentation uh, by Chuki Nanjran Swami uh, from India, providing agroecology upscaling experiences from India. And then we will have Dr. Sarah Shear uh, sitting here, discussing experience in Kenya and Honduras. And after that, there will be a discussion facilitated by uh, Emma Siriprandi sitting also in front. The session will be closed by my colleague, 
uh, from Addis uh, Pemo Komoto. So before we begin, I'd like to share with you some rules and dynamics for the webinar session. Microphones will be muted uh, during the presentation. If you think of questions while the presentations are in progress, please share it with us via the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. We will read your questions during the Q&A session. The chat, win chat window will remain open throughout the webinar if you would like to interact with us or other participants in the session. And this quick meeting interface will, by default, be displayed in English. But if you prefer, you could change the language at the top of the screen. And we can let us, uh, you can let us know if you need help by clicking the hand-shaped icon in the lower right corner during the whole session. This session is being recorded and will be available on our Learning for Nature YouTube channel uh, shortly after this session. So without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to our session facilitator, Ms. Emma Siriprandi, who is the lead focal point for the Scaling Up Agroecology Initiative based at FAO in Rome, but she's here with us today in New York. Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Dori. It's a pleasure to be here. I think this initiative of having um, jointly seminars and webinars is uh, very important to raise awareness on this issue that we are trying to mainstream in our organization. I would like to introduce Emil Frison, that will be our, our speaker uh, today, uh, he's a member of the International Panel on, of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, a Belgian national. He spent his entire career in international agricultural research for development, including six years in Africa, in Nigeria, and Mauritania. In 2003, he became Director General of Biodiversity International and developed a strategy entitled Diversity for Wellbeing, focused in the co contribution of agriculture biodiversity to the nutritional quality of diets and to the sustainability, resilience, and productivity of smallholder agriculture. Dr. Frizan is the lead author of the IPRIS Food Report from University from Uniformity to Diversity a paradigm, paradigm shift from industrial agriculture to diversify agroecological system. And he is the chair of the board of directors of Eco Agriculture Partners. Mr. Frison, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emma. And first, I want to thank uh, UNDP for having organized this uh, webinar. Uh, I think it is a very timely uh, moment to speak about this relationship between agriculture and the broader uh, impact it has on the world, not only on the environment, but also on people. Uh, there are several reports that came out. You mentioned, Midori, the IPBES uh, report. There have been a few other alarming reports about insect populations, about the disastrous uh, evolution of our health as a consequence of unsustainable uh, diets. So um, I think this, this is a very timely thing. And I will be sh uh, talking about agroecology. Uh, it's a term that is still not sufficiently uh, familiar for uh, many people. So I'll try to make you more familiar and show how this can really be a key uh, tool contributing to the realization of the 2030 uh, agenda. Well, we hear more and more that our food system is broken. Uh, the triple burden of malnutrition, uh, not only uh, an increasing number in the last few years of hungry people, micronutrient deficiencies, but also the, what I would call a time bomb of uh, obesity and non-communicable diseases, including in uh, the uh, low and middle income countries. The negative impact on health of our current model of agriculture with pesticide poisoning, killing 200,000 people a year, uh, the problems of antibiotic resistance, 
nitrates in drinking water, etc., and broader environmental degradation, biodiversity losses, we just heard about the amplitude of that, uh, but also water pollution, soil degradation, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and in general, unsustainable use of natural resources. The social inequities, poverty uh, among uh, farmers is still a major problem. The, the rural uh, populations are also still the majority of the hungry people. Uh, and there is this feeling of disempowerment. And in general, there's been uh, a neglect of cultural values. Uh, often it doesn't even get mentioned in discussions. And a lot of that is associated with our current model of, of food systems that are based on conventional or industrial agriculture, which, uh, which is based on specialization, focusing on a few species, and high input, uh, high use of, of uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Now, of course, there are, there's a whole range of different types of agriculture that are practiced, and I will just take two extremes here. Uh, a very specialized, high input, what I would call industrial agriculture that is not sustainable and that is causing a lot of the problems that I've just mentioned. But we also have in many developing countries still underperforming subsistence agriculture that we must make uh, perform better in order to achieve the goals of feeding people uh, and uh, maintaining the environment uh, integrity. And what we need is really that all these systems and everything in between, of course, converge towards a, a sustainable form of agriculture, which we call diversified agroecological farming. What we mean by that, it is a form of agriculture that is addressing at the same time economic, environmental, health, social and cultural objectives. And not just looking at maximizing yield at the expense of most of the other uh, dimensions. And what do we mean by agroecology or these diversified agroecological systems? It is the uh, optimizing the use of diversity to create synergies between species and resilience uh, by not putting all your eggs in one basket. It's incorporating perennials in fields, uh, uh, trees, uh, um, and uh, is favoring mixed farming. It's avoiding uh, fossil fuel-based inputs. It's about recycling nutrients and build the soil microbiome, and I'll be coming back to that later. It's uh, making uh, use of appropriate mechanization adapted to small-scale farming, which are still the predominant uh, form of food production in the world. It's also to be seen as complementing other land uses within a sustainable landscape. It's encouraging local transformation and value addition in order to improve uh, livelihoods uh, at the local level and combining farmer and traditional knowledge with modern science. And finally, it aims to empower people to be innovator and, uh, innovators and critical agents of change. What are these systems uh, able to deliver? On an economic point of view, it has now been shown that uh, from a total productivity point of view, we can match or almost match uh, the most performing industrial form of agriculture. And in general, we get a better income because of the diversification and use of, of local transformation, higher um, use of uh, specialized crops. But what is extremely important, especially for, for smallholder farmers that have no reserves, it's a much higher resilience and stability. Uh, which is a major objective for, uh, for smallholder farmers. From the environmental point of view, it's a way to transform agriculture from a major problem producing 25% of, of greenhouse gas emissions to a solution by uh, putting carbon in the soil and in the trees that are planted in the fields. It's boosting biodiversity. It has the capacity to restore degraded land. And when we know that uh, about 25% of the total land area uh, un that was under cultivation is degraded and that every year we lose the uh, cultivated land equivalent to uh, the Philippines. Uh, this is really a very important um, aspect. And finally, it's improving ecosystem services provided in uh, agricultural landscapes in terms of water and nutrient cycling, pollination, 
pest and disease management, but also others uh, re regarding uh, recreation, etc. From a nutrition and health outcome, first of all, it avoids the negative health outcomes of industrial agriculture by not using pesticides, uh, prevent, making no preventive use of antibiotics uh, and uh, no nitrates. It provides for a diverse and healthy diet and uh, also plants and animals grown uh, uh, with those uh, systems provide higher levels of beneficial nutrients such as omega-3 fatty acids in milk and meat or antioxidants such as polyphenols in, in plants. The uh, social and cultural outcomes, uh, this is, these are systems that provide for more employment. The question of keeping employment in rural areas is really a critical one and if we can provide a decent income and, and a new attractive way of performing agriculture, we can bring youth back in agriculture. Uh, by the diversification, it's uh, providing for employment throughout the year and is not having all the problems of uh, seasonal workers that are often uh, is, um, treated. And it's also restoring the closer links between the consumers and the producers uh, by having shorter supply chains. And finally, mm -hmm. Uh, from a cultural point of view, uh, it's bringing back a lot of the traditional crops that were abandoned in or that have not been addressed in agricultural research uh, for uh, several decades now. And it's integrating traditional knowledge uh, with the modern science. We often hear now, because of climate change, uh, we have to have climate smart agriculture. Well, actually, agroecology is the most comprehensive form of climate smart agriculture because it's not just looking at uh, the carbon issue or adaptation but it's looking also at addressing biodiversity losses soil and environmental degradation it also addresses nutrient nutrition and health problems and addresses uh, social uh, equity and cultural issues so this is important to keep in mind that, that um, if we want really to be uh, climate smart plus, uh, this is a, a way forward. Also, it embraces really the spirit of the 2030 agenda by uh, looking in an integrated way, not just eat goal in isolation, but bringing uh, about these synergies. It, it helps achieve multiple objectives to integrate the practices that uh, support coherent cross-sectoral policies. It places people at the center, empowering them to be critical agents of change and also contribute to really multiple uh, SDGs. And the, the Scaling Up Agroecology uh, an, an initiative that I'll talk about uh, in a minute really matches that transformative ambition of the 2030 agenda uh, in supporting countries to meet their commitments. So it's not just about producing more food and, and addressing the zero hunger SDG, but it's addressing at least 12 of the SDGs in a direct way, and I would say all of them in, in an indirect way. Why is this not more ad adapted more widely? Uh, well, we identified in IPS Food uh, a number of what we call lock-ins or barriers to change, and that goes from path dependency, where if you invested in a specialized crop, uh, it's very difficult then to diversify out of that. Many countries put uh, too much attention to a few export commodities at the expense of uh, food security. Feed the world narrative that we, we hear often, by 2050 there will be 9, 10 billion people, and then implicitly say, and therefore we must have more uh, intensified industrial agriculture to feed all those people. Of course, omitting to say that there is an alternative that can achieve the same thing in uh, a more sustainable way. Compartmentalized thinking, uh, ministries don't talk to each other, environment, agriculture, health, etc. Uh, Short-term thinking, uh, in, on the political agenda, you want to achieve results within your mandate, uh, and even in the private sector, with the greater financialization of, of business, um, quick returns on investment are, are indispensable. So it's difficult to invest in long-term solutions. And finally, measures of success. As long as we keep having tons per hectare of a commodity as the major way of measuring success in agriculture, we won't get there. We must measure what matters to people. And finally, the concentration of power in the agribusiness uh, today. If we look at 
the multiple sectors, uh, whether it's seed, fertilizers, agrochemicals, R&D in poultry or pigs, uh, the grain trade, just a few companies have really the vast majority of the market and their power is, is extremely important. And if you look at the retail and transformation side, you see all a whole load of different brands uh, in a supermarket, but when you see the companies behind them, they are also very, very few. And so you have a tremendous concentration, not only horizontal concentration where uh, one company buys up others or, or creates mergers, but also vertical integration where a company goes from the feed inputs to the uh, feed mill, livestock producer, slaughterhouse, uh, further processing and retailer. And so they uh, have a way to capture virtually all the wealth created in the system, uh, leaving very little for the farmer and little choice for the consumer. Now, uh, if we want to change to happen, we have to address these different lock-ins. Uh, I don't have time to go uh, through all of the uh, possible ways, uh, but we certainly should start looking at developing different indicators, but also uh, look at uh, supporting shorter supply chains, using public procurement as a way to uh, favor uh, the sustainable production methods, uh, supporting uh, research and development in this area. Uh, I just gave an example uh, a few days ago about the investment made in this country in the United States between 0.5 and 1.5 percent of the USDA budget is going to agroecology or let's say non-industrial model of agriculture. Uh, that gives you an idea on how much this uh, is still neglected today and that needs to be corrected. So if we look at measuring what matters instead of just looking at tons per hectare, we should be uh, measuring nutrient content and availability of that nutrition to the people that need it, the total outputs per hectare and not just one uh, major commodity, total biomass, resource efficiency, ecosystem services that are delivered in these landscapes, and the livelihood resilience and social equi equity that is uh, characterizing these uh, production systems. Change will only happen if, if we all work together. Uh, we can't have just one sector dealing with this or one type of organization. And I like this quote which says that successful transformation results from linking together many different players and organizations, each working in their own domain of influence with their own strategies, at their own levels of influence, from local to, to global, but coalescing around shared values and vision to bring about system transformation. And I think that shared value and vision is what we uh, want to describe there in uh, sustainable food systems, and more particularly here, sustainable agriculture through agroecology. Things are already happening. Uh, we're not starting from scratch. Uh, there are many examples. Uh, this is one report that was just published a year ago uh, by IPIS Food. FAO has uh, a compilation of other case studies um, and there are further case studies being that are going to be published uh, soon by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. Uh, and we must uh, really looking at uh, how to build on these and learn lessons from these to move forward. Now, FAO, uh, I think, is playing a very important role in bringing about uh, the necessary momentum to move ahead uh, at scale now with this. Uh, it started in 2014 when uh, FAO organized the first international uh, symposium on agroecology for food security and nutrition. That was followed up by a series of seven regional seminars uh, in different continents and uh, was culminated in a second international uh, symposium on scaling up agroecology to achieve the SDGs in April last year. And that's where uh, it was decided to launch the Scaling Up Agroecology Initiative uh, between FAO uh, and other UN organizations. The uh, symposium also proposed the adoption of 10 elements or 10 principles of agroecology uh, that uh, cover things like diversity, synergies, co-creation and sharing of knowledge, resilience, recycling, uh, efficiency, 
circular and solidarity economy, uh, looking at culture and food traditions, uh, human and social values, and uh, responsible governance. So the, these, rather than having a, um, a description or a definition of agroecology, it is best defined by this set of principles because there's no, it's not a silver bullet uh, well, or a blueprint that you can just replicate. It's a, an approach, a, a set of principles that guide adoption and adaptation at the local level. So the Scaling Up Agroecology Initiative uh, identified three areas of work about knowledge and innovation, about policy processes and building connections. Uh, a few initial uh, key actions uh, to scale agroecology were proposed uh, to strengthen the role of family farmers and their organizations, foster the experience and knowledge sharing and collaborative research and innovation, promote markets uh, for agroecologically based uh, uh, products for health, nutrition, and sustainability, review the institutional policy, legal, and financial frameworks to promote agroecology and uh, transition, and to take this to scale through integrated and participatory territorial processes. Um, what, what is needed for scaling up agroecology? Well, we mentioned already developing family farmer-led and participatory research and co-innovation. We must move from this 0.5% investment uh, to uh, a significant share of investment in this area. Developing transdisciplinary research, combining modern science and, and traditional knowledge, include agroecology in uh, university curricula, promoting technical, social and, and institutional innovations, uh, and, and not just focusing on the technology alone, investing in massive capacity development, uh, developing a framework to assess the performance of uh, food and agricultural systems in this uh, framework, and look also at governance and data management. So uh, FAO has also been uh, developing tools and, and uh, sets of uh, ways to support this initiative. Uh, there's a set of publication of resources, experiences and events available on the website. Um, there is a monthly newsletter, uh, there's a uh, collection of uh, country legislation and agreements and policies that uh, regard agroecology and a knowledge hub uh, that will be a repository of not only publications but also articles, courses and, and um, multimedia resources. I think that UNDP, for the reasons, Midori, that you already mentioned, your presence in, in so many different countries uh, on the ground uh, the very large number and, and sizable projects that are being implemented. I think this is really uh, key to the success of the scaling up. We're also uh, managing a, a, a wide portfolio uh, in which agriculture can play a, a role. And finally, having this explicit goal of supporting countries to, integ uh, to have an integrated approach towards the implementation of the, the SDGs. I think for all these reasons, UNDP can really play a key role in moving forward with the Scaling Up Agroecology uh, Initiative. We must also make sure that this is done in partnership with others and we will be looking for opportunities uh, at the country levels to see what activities other partners, uh, IFAD, uh, uh, UNEP, um, the uh, World Health Organization, etc., uh, can uh, do at the local level to integrate better uh, activities. Um, so, whether we start from underperforming uh, subsistence agriculture or from an under, uh, from an unsustainable form of industrial agriculture, we must move towards sustainable forms of, of um, applying agroecology. Uh, to sustainable forms of farming, but what we don't want to see is, and that is still happening today, is that subsistence agriculture is pushed towards unsustainable uh, industrial model of agriculture, and there are very clear vested interests that are pushing that, and we must face those uh, in a very clear way, and I think that's one of the ambitions of the Scaling Up Agroecology uh, Initiative. So. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Emil. Uh, we have now uh, some minutes to, to debate with the audience, and so we are open to, to your questions. I saw in the website that we have some comments. Um, one of the comments asking for uh, more examples uh, from the field in South Asia. Maybe we can wait for the video that we will present uh, yeah. in a few minutes. But uh, also, if you want to to comment about and uh, another comment is about the unsustainable demand for for meat in our society as a driver to unsustainable diets and to unsustainable agriculture system. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, another comment uh, that other ecology uh, requires strong involvement of rural devel development, and this uh, should be supported by uh, local government as well. So uh, I don't know if you want to comment Ma some of maybe, this. Maybe yes, <laughs> yes, maybe a few. Uh, indeed, we will hear more uh, from. Um, Chucky in, in a moment, uh, but I think uh, there are already examples where this is happening at scale, uh, and um, not only the particular example that Chucky will mention, but more broadly in India, uh, the, the initiative started in Maharashtra, uh, where they, they call, th their name for agroecology is zero budget natural farming, uh, and you will hear more about that which is now applied also in Karnataka, and that's the example that Chuki will be talking about, but also Andhra Pradesh, uh, where it started as a, a, farmer, a farmer movement that was promoting this, and it was really a reaction to uh, the unsustainable form in which agriculture was practiced. People were getting into debt, uh, and it led to, to a lot of suicides uh, that are well known, but also the, the whole health problems that were related to uh, agriculture. And so it was in reaction to that, that uh, this form of um, agriculture, zero budget natural farming was uh, being promoted. And this has now been taken up by the government of uh, Andhra Pradesh, who uh, has set the goal of uh, having all six million farmers uh, converting to uh, zero budget natural farming by 2025. 20, uh, they are already 600,000, uh, were already 600,000 last year. This year it should be 1 million, and they aim to have all uh, 6 million farmers uh, adopting this model. There are other states that are also starting. So we are really seeing a, a vast movement in India. Regarding meat, maybe one word. The overconsumption of wheat of meat is is a problem, but mainly in in richer countries. Uh, we must not forget that there are many uh, poor people that don't eat enough meat according to uh, WHO uh, recommendations. It is clear that we can't just change the agriculture side uh, of the equation in the food system. Uh, things must also change on the consumption side, and I think uh, the uh, lowering consumption of meat in those countries that eat too much meat, according to uh, health standards, and uh, a reduction of waste, uh, which is responsible for one third of, of the total uh, food that is being produced. Uh, I think those are essential elements that have to change on the consumption side. So we cannot just work in isolation on agriculture and um, uh, not address the, the consumer side. We must work at, at both at the same time. Uh, we have uh, other comments, uh, if you can address them. If it's possible, the transformation of conventional agriculture into agroecology uh, in the, the relation to the scale of the farmer. And also, bear in mind the system, technology, and the innovation available today. If it is possible to promote this transformation, I are asking if you have a positive examples uh, regarding palm oil commodities improving in agriculture. I think the the transformation from industrial to agroecology uh, it it depends very much 
on the local situation. As I said, there isn't a single blueprint. Uh, if you start in areas like the um, central part of, of this country, where you have huge areas of monoculture uh, or, or rotation of just maize and soy and maize and soy, uh, where that have been using a lot of uh, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, uh, you need a, a transformation, a transition period in order to rebuild the soil health. And that is, that is really uh, one of the major consequences of the industrial form of agriculture is that the synthetic fertilizers and the pesticides have basically uh, killed all life and made the soil uh, virtually uh, just a, a physical substrate. Um, and it's no longer the soil that feeds the plants. You have to feed them directly, uh, almost like in hydroponics. Uh, and to rebuild a, a soil takes some time. So there is a transition period in, in which you have to uh, adapt your practices uh, to gradually move uh, towards the total, total suppression. In other areas where you have not been making such a, an intensive use, um, many, uh, many in many de developing countries, uh, you can reap the benefits of agroecology much more rapidly uh, because you do not have had, uh, you have not had this, these uh, negative consequences of, of uh, excessive use of uh, synthetic inputs. And I think the uh, the set of uh, technologies and approaches are available. Um, we, there's nothing, although we, we have to advocate for more research still, but there is enough uh, packages of uh, uh, sets of practices that are available that can be applied immediately. There's one area of research that is particularly uh, exciting now, is really understanding what is happening in the life in the soil. Uh, in the last few years, we found out that there are orders of magnitude more different species of microorganisms in the soil, and we start only now to understand their function and how uh, they can contribute to capturing nutrients from the soil to feed the plants. This is an area that we still uh, need to invest much more on that has a tremendous uh, potential. There's another question about uh, subsidies. Uh, given to monoculture and industrial farming operations is a key problem that needs to be overcome in order to transition to agroecology. So what do you suggest about that? That is indeed, uh, it, it is re reflected in one of the lock-ins um, that you, many countries are still providing either subsidies for fertilizers uh, or certain um, subsidies specialized just on a few major commodities. Uh, that is one of the main uh, things that has to change. I, I was at the, the World Bank uh, just a couple of days ago, and there also they realize now that one of the major things that they can do is to uh, help countries to move their incentives, subsidies, and other incentives from consequences that have uh, a negative impact on the environment, on human health, etc., to uh, supporting or subsidizing activities that are positive for the environment, positive for human health. So this incentive uh, re reshaping and, and redirecting incentives is a, really a crucial part of the transformation that we need. Thank you, Emi. Just if you want me. So we have a global project called the Biodiversity Finance Initiative. Mm -hmm. In that project, we are working with certified countries and directly with Ministry of Finance and National Development Agencies. And, and this, you know, looking at different sort of subsidies or expenditure which might affect negatively on biodiversity conservation, that's part of uh -huh. our work in that. So that's just to, to let you know, well, that's, that's one good example, example of what should be done. Yeah, we are yeah. doing. <laughs> Well, uh, going to the field, uh, we will have now uh, the presentation of a video um, with uh, our colleague uh, Chuki Nanjundaswamy. <laughs> uh, she is the coordinator of the Amrita Bumi Center 
a peasant agroecology training school that was created by the farmers' movement of Karnataka, Karnataka Rajio Raita Tanga. Amrita Bumi is linked to the international small farmers' movement called La Via Campesina. Chucky is one of the key women farmers' leaders of uh, TRRS <coughs> and is involved in various national networks of farmers' orga organizations in India. Uh, RRS is part of an uh, effort to mobilize state uh, support for zero budget natural farming in Karnataka, as uh, Emil uh, just uh, mentioned, informed by the su successes in neighbor neighboring Andhra Pradesh states. Chucky has provided leadership to many farmers' campaigns, especially in the areas of agriculture, women, and youth. So let's uh, listen to Chucky. Namaste. I'm Chukki Nanjundaswamy from Karnataka State Farmers Association, which is a farmers movement started in the year 1980 to fight for the rights of the farmers and the dignified life of farmers. A farmers movement which did not only address the issues of uh, the agrarian crisis, but also tried to work on finding solutions for the very reasons of the crisis. So this is where we started working on agroecology and we started looking for different agroecological approaches. Mr. Subhash Palekar, who worked in the agricultural uh, department of the government of Maharashtra for uh, many years, and then he found out that that was not what the Indian agriculture required. The sure. practices of ZBNF revolves around what Mr. Palekar calls as the four pillars of ZBNF. ZBNF has a major emphasis on the self-reliance and autonomy of the farm families. ZBNF is all about delinking farmers from external input and credit market by not purchasing anything from the external actors and particularly from big corporations. One is the conservation of biodiversity. By using local varieties of seeds, by diversifying your crops and by mulching, you're basically conserving your local biodiversity and not only diversifying your farm but also diversifying your own uh, food on your plate. So hence this can be uh, an answer to the uh, malnutrition. The other impact uh, we can think of is uh, how the carbon gets fixed by using lots of trees on the farm. The, the, the carbon sinking happens on your farm and you don't need to have carbon credits for it for that and uh, so this big this is an answer to climate change and uh, the net income goes up the farmers are basically not purchasing anything from outside and they have the knowledge of producing their own microbial cultures and they are they know how to have uh, uh, symbiotic uh, cropping patterns so Hence, you don't buy anything from outside. Whatever uh, comes from your farm, it, it's, a, it's a profit. And another very interesting factor what we have seen, what we have been seeing in uh, many uh, trainings conducted by Mr. Palakar, in which thousands of people take part, majority of them are young people. The Green Revolution has pushed the young people out of agriculture but agroecology is welcoming back young people to agriculture. Gradually, uh, when farmers started practicing it, when it started uh, coming in the media, the interest among the farming communities uh, started increasing 
and uh, together with the farmers movement of Karnataka many different organizations joined hands including the IT people from urban areas. So there were many uh, progressive religious institutions in Karnataka uh, gave their uh, premises and food for thousands of people. When I say thousands of people it was uh, I'm talking about uh, 6,000 people, 7,000 people for each training camp which used to happen for at least a period of a week. What is interesting here is that all, this ha all these things happened voluntarily. Many volunteers took part in this. Many uh, professionals have given up their uh, professions and have joined this movement. Now this movement has uh, uh, you know, reached the, the level of uh, public policy. But at that time, it barely received any attention from university scientists or public policy makers or politicians in spite of our long, long, long effort. One of the first states uh, in India which started uh, zero budget natural farming as a public policy was Andhra Pradesh. Many other states can definitely learn from Andhra Pradesh, the experience of Andhra Pradesh on how to uh, revive the lives of the farmers and the rural communities uh, in a sustainable manner. The women uh, who are part of the self-help groups are the ones who are leading the trainings of uh, ZBNF. Unlike many other agricultural extension programs, ZBNF is not a technology transmission model. In Andhra Pradesh, uh, ZBNF is extended through uh, horizontal participatory social learning. There are master farmers and uh, these master farmers are training the other farmers. And this is a farmer to farmer uh, learning what they have adopted in Andhra Pradesh. The APZBNF program has consciously created a special space for the women farmers and particularly the landless people. And it has also uh, created an employment opportunity for the rural youth as technicians uh, in, uh, in the rural livelihood programs. And uh, we, what we have to uh, recognize in the APZBNF program is that most of the trainers are women who teach men, which you normally don't see in the rural Indian context. The state also has an initiative of uh, custom rental uh, shops for uh, small uh, machineries for the groups to rent to reduce uh, women uh, drudgery and uh, also to sell non-pesticide uh, uh, and cow-based uh, formulations. This has actually created uh, uh, opportunities for uh, rural women and rural youth to stay in the villages and uh, think of alternative livelihood uh, options. And the coming together of self-help groups and ZBNF uh, program together has actually not just uh, addressing the agrarian crisis in Andhra Pradesh, but also uh, uh, creating uh, many more opportunities uh, for uh, the depressed uh, rural communities. I wish agroecology will be seriously taken up by United Nations and uh, by all the member states and uh, agroecology is the only answer for all kinds of crises that uh, the humankind is going through. The climate change and uh, the food crisis and the crisis of malnutrition and uh, many other things. So we cannot go towards the model of corporate agriculture we have to go towards the model of food sovereignty and food sovereignty can be achieved only through agroecology. Thank you again. We are uh, back now uh, with uh, Sarah Shear from Eco Agriculture Partners. Sarah is an agriculture and natural resource economist specializing in land management policy in tropical developing countries. She is president and uh, CEO of the non-profit Eco Agriculture Partners, which promotes sustainable landscapes globally through research, technical support to landis landscape partnerships, 
and policy dialogue. She currently serves on the U.S. Board of the International Agriculture Biodiversity Research Organization, Biodiversity International, as well as on the advisory board of Food Tank as a member of the UN Agri Food Task Force. And one of the board of U.S. nonprofit Solutions from the Land. Please, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emma, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are on the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to build on the discussions that have already been presented by Emil and Chuki uh, to think about how we can scale agroecology uh, to the levels that are being discussed in India and elsewhere. And I think Chuki's example, um, it provides an excellent one uh, where a large group of different actors came together to support a very rapid scaling up of, of agroecology in the context of broader sustainable development efforts. And so I want to talk a little bit about what the experience has been with these landscape partnerships that are emerging around the world and how they can specifically be used to scale up agroecology and sustainable food systems. Let me first clarify uh, what I mean when I'm using the term landscape. We're referring to the whole set of soils, water, forests, wetlands, um, human settlements, infrastructure, all of the resources in a large area that has an identity because of the relationship between the people and the, the landscape. And where those people depend upon that whole landscape to provide the whole range of goods and services that are critical for their lives, food, feed, fiber, fish, energy, habitat for biodiversity, ecosystem services like controlling water quality and water flow, the, the pollinators in the system, human health, um, human culture in that landscape. There's many demands on the landscape, there's many actors in the landscape, and good management at the scale of the landscape is actually essential in order to generate the synergies for producing all of those different things, all of those sustainable development goals in every landscape, and preventing them from creating conflicts and competition among them. So agroecology is a key element in most sustainable landscapes. Um, food systems are central, um, and agroecological systems, as has just been discussed, can provide all of these co-benefits to the economy, to the environment, to health, social benefits, and cultural benefits. Can become a positive, agriculture can be a positive um, factor in turning the whole system around towards sustainability. And I think one of the things that's really important to, to think about is where those farms and fields sit within a larger landscape. Um, they, depending on where they are, flows of water move from the highlands into the wetlands, into the farms, and down into the streams. And thinking about where the farms fit in those flows of water, in stopping or advancing or slowing the flows of water, how flows of nutrients move through the landscape, how wildlife moves through the landscape. The role of farms and fields are quite critical in those. So they have really strong relationships. And by the same token, the health of those other parts of the landscape have a direct impact on the viability of agriculture within them and uh, the availability of water to them, the availability of pollinators to them, et cetera. So in recognition of this, all around the world, what has happened even before there was any kind of public support for them have been the formations of these landscape partnerships with farmers and forest actors and protected area managers and governments and sometimes private sector actors who all saw that if they did not align what they were doing if around a vision for sustainability in the landscapes, that each of them was going to fail in reaching the objectives that, that they had. Um, and this shows the results of a set of studies that were done, uh, that Eco Agriculture Partners did together with CATIA, the World Agroforestry Center, the International Water Management Institute, and, and Habitat in Europe 
to document about 428 of these large-scale landscapes, all of which agriculture and sustainable agriculture was a very important outcome, but also many environmental variables were really important outcomes, livelihoods, poverty reduction, income growth, resilience, climate action, were part of these landscape um, partnerships. And in fact, um, thank you. okay, in, in fact, uh, we've got about 95 different words for this, territorial development, watershed management, biological corridors, et cetera. But what they all have in common are these five elements, collaborative community engaged processes, shared or agreed management objectives, the practices themselves contribute to multiple objectives, and you pay attention to these spatial interactions between the spaces and align your markets and public policies. What I'd like to do is show you a couple of uh, brief examples where these kinds of large-scale landscape partnerships really help to move change in agroecology. The first one is in the tropical highlands of Kenya, in the Kijabe landscape, which had about 125,000 people in it. Um, but it's also right near Nairobi. It, it is the last remaining natural forest in this, this uh, one of the last ones in the country. It's a critical water tower for Nairobi, a critical place for biodiversity in the central part of, of, of this area, and it's full of smallholder farmers who are not who, who really are poor and, and really need to have livelihood improvements. So initially, the um, landscape partnership that started there was started there by a youth conservation organization. I'm trouble moving. My, there you go. A youth conservation organization called Kenvo about 25 years ago. Um, and they did a lot of work to protect their forest from all of the pressures that were trying to, to, to clear it. But after about 10 years, they realized that, yes, the, farm, the forest was benefiting, but the people were not benefiting. And they reached out and said, we're all farmers. We're not just forest conservators. Um, how can we improve what we're doing in farming? And they reached out to um, farm, farm and development NGOs. They reached out to local banks. They reached out to a wide range of other actors and said, how can we also produce a kind of an agriculture that will raise our incomes, but also still directly contribute to the protection of our forests and our water resources that are here. And, and the kinds of things that they began to partner themselves really show the power of bringing in different sectors to support agroecology scaling. Um, they developed an environmental landscape label to help them in marketing in Nairobi and said, our products save your water tower. Our products save your biodiversity. And they found new marketing niches. They brought in technical assistance for all sorts of small scale greenhouse work, agroforestry, um, zero grazing, um, honey production. And they not only used agroecological practices for these, but they also linked them directly in terms of providing technical assistance to the environmental involvement of the local communities in forest protection and biodiversity conservation. They developed agroecotourism trails where local people brought people around to see both the bio, gorgeous biodiversity of the birds, et cetera, but also the, the, the agricultural systems that they were doing. And now more than 10,000 uh, people have been benefited from these, these scaling up of these practices. Um, the second case I wanted to do is a, quite a different area, which is in the lowland tropics of Honduras, which was traditionally the center of export agriculture for the country of Honduras. Um, and one of the big changes there had been so much going on, big growth of oil palm production, um, which was creating all sorts of problems from, from water pollution damage to the coral reef, which was the most unique and important coral reef, the source of biodiversity in the marine area, new flooding risks from forest clearing, and meanwhile, very high immigration because of very rapid economic growth and very high rural poverty in this area. So lots of issues. And the oil palm producers there recognized that they were not going to get any markets anywhere in Europe with the kind of situation that they were in with this high deforestation. And so they said they needed to go beyond trying to get a, a round table for, for sustainable palm oil certification. They needed to help get the whole landscape involved. So the, the uh, NGO Solidaridad came in to help reach out to all the major land use sectors. Uh, they brought in municipal governments, environmental NGOs, farmer organizations, women's groups. And they began a much more uh, an ambitious partner to accelerate. They did many other things besides agriculture in the water sector, the forest sector, protected area, marine, et cetera. But on the agroecology side, 
They are in the process of shifting the area on slopes from palm oil to cocoa agroforestry systems, uh, looking at diversification of products, et cetera, and mobilizing finance around this. Um, I think these are just some examples of how UNDP can build on its remarkable set of programs around the world to support these kind of integrated strategies for, for, to reach the sustainable development goals. I think in particular, um, I know you're already doing a lot, um, UNDP, uh, through your, everything from your Satoyama initiative, your green commodity programs, your SDG community development programs, your accelerator, you're, you're doing a lot of things, you're doing a lot of landscape programs, but this could actually be a mechanism for integrating a variety of the kinds of objectives that you had by supporting these multi-stakeholder landscape platforms, by explicitly mapping agroecology potentials to ecosystem services and biodiversity and livelihoods within those landscapes, by linking the new incentives and services for agroecology to environmental benefits as well as, uh, as livelihood benefits, and by building landscape investment portfolios that include the kinds of investments that are suitable for the development of agroecology. So I, I put those out there as a, as a few ideas. Uh, Eco Agriculture Partners is, is collaborating now with Rainforest Alliance and many other organizations to build an ambitious new initiative on a thousand landscapes by 2030 would be um, promoting these kinds of integrated development strategies including agroecology. So. Thank you very much, Sarah Shear from Eco Agriculture Partners for sharing these uh, histories with us and these uh, reflections on how to uh, promote agroecology at the uh, territorial, territorial and, land, level. and landscape, landscape level. Uh, we have uh, already uh, two or three comments and questions. And the uh, first one that I uh, uh, would like to, to put on the table <laughs> is how to integrate social and cultural perspectives from traditional knowledge in on-the-ground initiatives on experiences on agroecology. How to, how to combine this traditional knowledge with the modern science, for instance? If, can we propose something that uh, integrates these different kinds of knowledge to uh, have a, a better experiences on the ground. And uh, the second question is about the markets. How can we promote and integrate markets for agroecology and especially for family farmers? I would like to add my one question <laughs> for myself. Uh, we saw that uh, the experiences that Chuki presented and also that you mentioned mm -hmm. on uh, Kenya and uh, Honduras, sometimes women are protagonists of uh, agroecological experiences mm -hmm. on the ground. But we know that uh, women face a lot of uh, difficulties to, to have the space to be protagonists of uh, these experiences. How do you think that agroecology's uh, way of, of uh, producing uh, and way of organizing things on the ground facilitate uh, women to, to be more recognized in, as uh, protagonists in this system? Okay. All really excellent questions. Um, let me start with the first one. Uh, to me, one of the real um, innovations of integrated landscape management under all of its different titles is providing a platform for direct engagement of different stakeholders. It's not how do we translate what local people have as their traditional knowledge and package that for policymakers. It's having the policymakers sitting down at the same table with people who have an opportunity to explain things to them. And maybe it's over a table and maybe it's through a field journey that they do together whereby they bring the farmers and maybe they don't have the, they don't use the same words and the process can help to translate that. And we've seen some really ex excellent examples where those have been moved in. And I think having the facilitation skills and tools to have those conversations happen directly is one of the most exciting things that I've seen in these landscape initiatives. It, it can't, it's not to be translated by somebody else. Um, the, yeah. On, on that, yeah. before we move on to something else, I, I think another aspect is really 
a retraining of researchers Absolutely. in participatory research. Yeah. Uh, in, in the past, I, I've been trained in agricultural research and it was very much in, a, in this linear form of, of uh, generating technologies in a laboratory, testing them in, yeah. in an experimental field and then passing it on to extension when there is an extension <laughs> and then I would say dumping it on farmers whether yeah. they like it or not. Uh, I think we have to really move away from that model uh, to a co-creation of uh, innovations, um, co-innovation where uh, the researchers are trained to engage in participatory uh, research processes where the, the local uh, knowledge and traditional knowledge is valued in the same way as, as, as uh, science is, is valued. So there's, there's a lot of retraining of of the, the scientists to be done to be uh, allowing that to happen. Great. Let me move on to your to your second question. And I think the market piece is, is absolutely central. And I would say that pretty much every landscape partnership that we've seen that's been successful has been partly because they have been able to look at the shifting markets and actually creating incentives in the market for um, local partners. Now sometimes that is conventional things like aggregating farmers so that they can sell in particular markets. But it is quite interesting, um, some of the opportunities, even some through certification, but most not through certification actually, where they find local markets and local providers. So in places where there's tourism and protected areas, there's a huge number of these that have are selling their products in restaurants that are marketing it to tourists that they are using these foods that were good for all the biodiversity, a, a, a lot of those things. It's finding um, uh, procurement uh, policies by local governments in their schools, et cetera, to bring the foods in. I think the, the, the market piece is absolutely central. And the important thing is that the market demand is linked to the social and environmental benefits that also come from the food, as well as the health, health, health benefits from the food. So we've seen some really remarkable partnerships between groups that never worked together before to try to create markets for these foods. Um, payments for ecosystem services is, is the other one that I think there's been a, a lot of, of, just a lot of innovation and we're starting to figure out how to do that well. Um, let me, let me ad ad address your question about women. One of the things that's been really interesting and a little bit frustrating for me is that um, in many of the places that we've worked where the women have played major, are playing major leadership roles at the community level in agroecology, but also in environmental management and in integrated strategies of sustainable development, when it shifts to some governance at the landscape level, you all often have a really big problem shifting to enabling women's leadership for everything from the way that meetings are planned and when meetings are planned to communication styles and a, a lot of other things. They're not paying attention. What's been interesting in the last couple of years is that uh, I think innovators around the world are coming up with new ways of managing those landscape partnerships that do enable the women's leadership to be in there. Certainly I would say that women's groups are very, very active in most of the landscape partnerships that we have seen and we have observed. And managing those platforms in ways that welcome the different women's groups that particularly, that when they're talking about investment and finance, they're actually talking about how do we finance the enterprises that women's are, women are running. Um, there's a facilitation piece about in inclusion that's relevant for women, that's relevant for marginalized other marginalized communities. Bringing, I'm amazed at how much enthusiasm there is for youth programming within these landscape partnerships as well. So I think it requires explicit attention of inclusion, but these platforms are being designed to enable that in a way that I think other forms uh, make much more difficult. If you look at what is actually happening on the ground, uh, a lot of the uh, initiatives in agroecology are actually initiated by mm -hmm. women self-help groups and yeah. other uh, local uh, community-based organizations yeah. run by women. They have been really, uh, I think, recognizing maybe faster than men the, the need for transition that is that is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, there is there were a couple of short questions uh, on the screen that, that disappeared now which I, I would like to address. There was one question about fertilizers in Africa. 
uh, you know, there is not much fertilizer used. Uh, mm -hmm. should, should we not increase the fertilizer use in, in Africa because of the Africa has uh, very ancient soils and, and, and poor soil? I, I think the, the we shouldn't be saying that there should be no fertilizer used in, under any circumstance. Uh, I, I think th this is being uh, dogmatic and that's not helpful. But I think where the priority should lie is really to rebuild the soil exactly. health. Yeah. And you will get faster results and more sustainable results by investing into uh, compost development, in uh, diversification, in uh, bringing in uh, to allow manure to be brought in, to have cover crops uh, being used to bring in uh, carbon, that will uh, achieve better results than just a marginal increase of, of fertilizer, which will not be sustainable. <laughs> and the second question was about the scale and the size of farms to which this applies. Uh, many people uh, have in mind, well, mm -hmm. agroecology, that is for horticulture or for small, small farms only. You can't do that on a large farm. But that's just not true. I mean, there are now more and more examples where really large-scale farms are applying yeah. agroecological uh, approaches and uh, do that successfully. Yeah. So I think that's a, a myth that has to be uh, dispelled. This is not just uh, to be operated at a small scale. The same principles apply at a large scale and have been applied and, and do work at a large scale. Yeah, this is the work we've been doing also even in the United States, uh, are seeing these offer opportunities. I wanted to just add one other thing. I think there is still, in some senses, a gap between the environmental movements and the agriculture and agroecology movements, <laughs> and that is that, that the soil, this issue about the underlying resource base being degraded. The soils are being degraded, the waters and the aquifers are being degraded, and the um, biodiversity resources upon which agriculture depends on, on is being degraded. And the, I think we need to expand the mental model that we're using when we think about the future of sustainable agriculture and say, we need agricultural landscapes to be regenerated, to be restored in all of their dimensions. And there will be major benefits for agricultural productivity, as, as well as resilience from that. And I think it's, it's a mental model issue as much as anything. I would recommend to uh, see our website, an FAO website that we call Agroecology Knowledge Hub. Uh, in our database, we have a lot of uh, experiences all around the world that uh, most of them are um, case studies uh, um, developed by the young participants. Mm -hmm. It's uh, first hand. Uh, um, information, but we have also a lot of articles and uh, uh, books and uh, other uh, review uh, um, texts that you can find information on that. How the how the experiences were developed, what the support they had, mm -hmm. uh, how was the organization of the beneficiaries, etc. And we. We have, a, of course, as uh, Emil uh, mentioned at the beginning, agroecology is not a silver bullet. It's not a recipe. It, it has to be adapted to the region, to the climate, to the history of the place, of enable uh, policies, etc. But it is interesting to see how it is possible to develop agroecology in such a different uh, landscapes and histories, etc. Oh, Maybe on that, I, I think to create a political will, uh, that there has to be uh, real work done on, on advocacy and, and demonstrating what is possible. And there has been uh, also efforts to marginalize or even discredit uh, agroecology people that come from, on the research side, for example, from a traditional education in agriculture that believe uh, only uh, progress can be made by applying the most uh, sophisticated science and have this uh, linear technology dissemination model as the only way to move forward. Uh, on the other hand, there are also vested interests that uh, want to protect their markets. Uh, Unsustainable, that support unsustainable practices uh, that continue to um, it, it, 
misinform uh, people, I would say. What is important to me is, is what is happening now with the Scaling Up Agroecology Initiative, with FAO in partnership with UNDP, UNEP and other organizations, uh, really recognizing that this is an important way uh, forward and that governments then will also see that this is not just something supported by marginal NGOs or etc. That it is being recognized at, a, at also at an intergovernmental level, and I think I see the scaling up agroecology initiative as a major tool to uh, develop this uh, political will uh, at the national level, so that they start investing in, with mm -hmm. their own resources. Yeah. I just wanted to add, there's also now a, a growing body of, 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 of evidence and experience on a, a integrated agriculture uh, landscape territorial management that brings in agriculture <coughs> and environment. You can find quite a bit of this on our website at www.ecoagriculture.org. Um, also, there have been over the last two decades an, a, a, a large number of simple facilitation tools for how do you make these conversations happen in a fruitful and reasonably rapid way so you can get to action planning. We are part convene a global convening of the Landscapes for People, Food and Nature Coalition, which includes FAO and UNDP have been members from the very beginning and very important uh, collaborators. And we did 28 major collaborative studies that showed things like what have we learned about applying markets in landscapes, what have we learned about financing landscape investments? What have we learned about landscape management and climate change, et cetera? So I do encourage you to, to look at some of those resources, including what is the policy framework needed to support this? And that's a whole, that speaks to the political world, please. Another question that I, I think we should address about the, uh, the benefits of agroecology regarding the fertilizers use. Uh, if the do the local rural folks use in agroecology should be provided monetary benefits. Rural folks promoting agroecology are getting less yield than using fertilizers and they are not able to compete the market. I think more or less, there is there is no evidence uh, that underlines this. In um, most of the experiences where agroecology has been applied, they've been able to double the yields over the, the starting or triple or quadruple. Or triple or quadruple. <laughs> it's really on really yeah. low yeah. yielding areas. And area. so uh, th this um, what what is often referred to is comparisons that have been made between organic agriculture and industrial agriculture in developed countries uh, where the organic agriculture is shown to be 10% or 20% lower in yields. And you can't transpose that to the situation in, in developing countries where you start from a very different base. And even the organic agriculture is not applying all the possible approaches that agroecology provides. It's just applying a few input substitution and a few other, uh, but it's not using the full toolkit if you want. So I think that that is is something that must be uh, dispelled, and uh, I think uh, a lot of information uh, can be found about uh, concrete examples. Uh, I can also refer to the uh, IPES food report that was mentioned by Midori uh, uh, by Emma in my introduction uh, from Uniformity to Diversity, which is really looking at uh, the, the potential uh, on all these aspects, on the economic, environmental, uh, nutrition, health, social and cultural uh, dimensions, uh, these and, and the case studies that I also mentioned can also be found on the uh, IPES Food uh, website. So that, that's just mm -hmm. IPESfood.org. Yeah. And for those of you who are looking at, at, at some of these, uh, sort of having these discussions, one of the other things is in some places where there have been these comparisons, they will look at what the yield of maize is per hectare relative to the yield of maize in an industrial system. But in the industrial system, 100% of the field is in maize, but in the in the agroecological one, maybe 60% of the field is in maize. And they're not including all the other products that are being done in that field. Yeah. So uh, you just have to look even, at it carefully. And yeah. also the trade-offs. Because as it's well. not only you right. that has to be measured, right. but all the systems. You know. It's not having your nephew in the hospital because of pesticide poisoning. Yeah, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The next one, sorry. Uh, 
the illustration. Yeah. If you, do you yes. have an illustration of a landscape level mindset shift among smallholder farmers from focusing on their individual farm plot to water shield level as a college mindset? Mm -hmm. Let me say that smallholder farmers are no less resistant or have no less difficult for them to take a landscape mindset than it is for any other actor within the landscape. That's been our experience. And in fact, when one is trying to form these coalitions, a very important part of that process is coming to a collaborative understanding of what's going on in the landscape. And that involves maps, it involves field trips, it involves showing people how what they're doing is influencing the larger landscape. But that's the big business people as well, and that's the, the municipal people as well. They need to come up with a joint assessment of what's going on in the landscape. And absolutely, I have seen that mindset switch in a matter of, of weeks. Uh, and sometimes it takes six months, or it takes a year. But I think they, there's, a, there's a lot of tools out there and facilitation processes that enable people to teach one another what is going on in their landscape and look at history and look at change. So I, I think we're in good shape on that one. The and first thing is to bring the people the, together yeah. to be able to have those. Yeah, and it's not one day. It's, yeah. it's a process of... To have a governance, a inclusion governance yeah. mechanism yeah. Yeah. that puts people together and uh, the transparency yeah, exactly. that they know that what they are discussing will have uh, implications on what we will be deciding. Right. We have well, one really really great tool that we've been working for, with for a long time called a landscape scorecard, in which you ask all the different groups in the landscape to say, how well is this landscape doing on food security? How well is it doing on biodiversity? And what you find is really different answers from different groups. And the trick of the tool is having them explain to one another why one group said biodiversity was good and another one said they weren't. And it's that process that they learn from one another. This is a very good question that maybe one of you all can answer about. Do we know anything about the cost structure or what it would what it no. takes to do these trainings? No, but maybe we can ask uh, Chuka, uh, Chuka to provide that information and to circulate yeah. it. Uh, yeah. We can provide yeah. that to yeah. you. I, I thought it was fascinating, though, that we had the other actors in the landscape that came forward and provided food for those trainings, yeah. that provided lodging for those trainings. And That's a, lot, a, a lot of uh, it is, is based on, on voluntary work yeah. Uh, yeah. that was yeah. done. So I, I would imagine that the budgets are uh, fairly modest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sorry, but I think <laughs> we should stop. Um, I, I would like to introduce now Pemo Komotsu. Uh, she currently serves as a regional technical advisor on ecosystems and biodiversity for the Africa region, based at the UNDP Regional Services Center for Africa in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She's also the UNDP Global Environmental Finance, UNDP Jeff, team's regional team leader. She's currently supporting several countries in the Africa region to develop and implement programs on sustainable food and agriculture production and deforestation free community. Please, uh, Pemo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for that introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank the speakers and co-organizers from um, the different uh, partners that we partnered this, co-organized this uh, seminar with today, uh, and to all of you participants for this uh, for an interactive session uh, today. Uh, it's very clear, obviously, that there's a, there's a crisis uh, with the conventional approach to agriculture and, uh, and the global food system itself is, uh, is facing a lot of uh, criticism uh, and because it has lots of pernicious effects on people and the planet uh, which uh, manifest themselves in um, a devastation of our of human health a devastation of ecosystem health uh, it's perpetuating inequalities and, and poverty even and devaluing uh, cultures around the world food cultures around the world 
Um, as we heard today, agroecology is one of the answers to the question of how we make agriculture and food systems feed people and at the same time heal the planet or maintain ecosystem health. Um, we've had uh, cases uh, of success in terms of transforming uh, agriculture and food system towards sustainability. Um, cases like uh, Brazil, um, Mexico, uh, Cuba, India itself, as we've heard from uh, from Chuki, uh, and many of these are driven um, by uh, you know a lot of factors, including uh, social and grassroots uh, movements such as La Via Campesina and. Um, and the different uh, movements that uh, that Chuki was mentioning in uh, in the Indian case. Uh, in fact, there's a growing uh, grassroots agroecology movement uh, in, in parts of the world, such as India and Mesoamerica. Um, and some of these, uh, some of the co the comments uh, from you um, colleagues uh, around the world also point to more cases that we may not even be aware of. Uh, but uh, I think putting a spotlight on some of these uh, will help in this um, in this question to scale up uh, some of these examples uh, to become uh, mainstream. Uh, obviously, scaling up agroecology is a complex challenge and there are lots of questions about how to transition and transform uh, the system uh, of agriculture, but hopefully some of these questions have been answered in today's webinar. Uh, but there's a clear need uh, for the many questions that remain to be answered. And in order to convince the powers that be, uh, so to speak, such as policymakers, financing institutions, um, and governments uh, to invest in, in this transformation or transition towards more sustainable uh, approaches to producing food and doing agriculture in general. Uh, we at UNDP are in the process of defining our focus and priority in the space uh, of sustainable agriculture and food systems and commodities um, and we will share this uh, in due course uh, and um, you know uh, with colleagues at the country le office level and with our external partners so that um, uh, everybody is aware and clear on where on what we think about this as UNDP and where we're going and how we're going to work with other stakeholders around the world and partners around the world such as the ones that we brought around the table today. Um, and I think agroecology is one of the things that we will highlight uh, in that uh, in that work that we'll be working on in the next in the next few months, uh, we're already partnering with FAO in this scaling uh, up uh, agroecology initiative and other partners um, around the world to try and um, ensure that our our work in this area of agriculture uh, integrates much more systematically uh, um, proven concepts uh, and approaches uh, such as agroecology. Uh, to conclude again, thank you very much. Um, if you have any further questions uh, or requests for reading materials, uh, check the FAU Agroecology, Agroecology Knowledge Hub um, website that uh, Emma mentioned and, uh, and reach out to us um, uh, in FAO, in, uh, in UNDP and even uh, our partners uh, from Equal Agriculture. Uh, and thank you to Midori for organizing this seminar. I think this is uh, the first step to uh, broadening this partnership and engaging on these kinds of subjects. Uh, in the future and um, we'll let you know and keep you posted on uh, on similar uh, webinars and, and, and seminars of, of similar subjects in the future. Thank you again. Cheers. Thank you all the participants and, and presenters for, for participating in this webinar. Uh, I myself personally found the presentations and discussions are very stimulating and I hope you all felt the same. So I can really see the potential of agroecology approach and that, that's really tremendous. So this is our first discussion, collective discussion, and we'll take it from here. Mm -hmm. And we also have a lunchtime seminar uh, today for those who are in New York. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to our collaboration. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very Goodbye, much. Everybody.